and let them offer sacrifices of thanksgiving and tell of his deeds in songs of joy. Let us stand together that we might hear our God's blessing to his people. Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, our help is in the name of the Lord who made heaven and earth. And he greets us this morning with these words from the book of Romans. To all those who are loved by God and called to be saints, grace to you and peace from God our Father and our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Let's take up our Psalters together and turn to number 46B and do what our call to worship said. Tell of his deeds and songs of joy. We'll sing about our God who is our refuge and our strength. So we'll sing together all the verses of number 46B. seated. We want to turn our attention now to the reading of God's law. The scriptures teach us that through the law comes the knowledge of sin. 
Romans 3.20. And the Apostle Paul testifies, I would not have come to know sin except through the law, Romans 7.7. Thus the law shows us our sin and consequently our need of Christ. So let's read the law of God together as we find it in Exodus chapter 20. And God spoke all these words saying, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of slavery. You shall have no other gods before me. You shall not make for yourself a carved image or any likeness of anything that is in heaven above or that is in the earth beneath or that is in the water under the earth. You shall not bow down to them or serve them for I, the Lord your God, am a jealous God, visiting the iniquity of the fathers on the children to the third and the fourth generation of those who hate me, but showing steadfast love to thousands of those who love me and keep my commandments. You shall not take the name of the Lord your God in vain, for the Lord will not hold him guiltless who takes his name in vain. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is a Sabbath to the Lord your God. On it you shall not do any work, you or your son or your daughter, your male servant or your female servant or your livestock or the sojourner who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made heaven and earth, the sea and all that is in them, and rested on the seventh day. Therefore, the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and made it holy. Honor your father and your mother that your days may be long in the land that the Lord your God is giving you. You shall not murder. You shall not commit adultery. You shall not steal. You shall not bear false witness against your neighbor. You shall not covet your neighbor's house. You shall not covet your neighbor's wife or his male servant or his female servant or his ox or his donkey or anything that is your neighbor's. And Jesus summarized this law in Matthew 22, verses 37 to 40, when he said, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your mind. This is the great and first commandment, and the second is like it. You shall love your neighbor as yourself. On these two commandments depend all the law and the prophets. Uh, We're called to hold this law up as a mirror to our lives. We often remind ourselves of that. We see God's rule for living how we are to love him and how we are to love our neighbor. And as we compare our lives to his rule for living, uh, we are meant to see how far short of that standard we fall. Uh, We're meant to see that and let it expose our sin to us, that we have to reckon with the reality of our sin, and then to bring us to the only place where we can find hope. We cannot find hope in the law. All the law can do is tell us what to do. It can't help us to do it or remedy when we've failed to do it. The only place we can find hope as sinners who've broken God's law is in the grace of God that's extended to us in Jesus Christ our Lord. And so we read the law, we come under its conviction, and then we go to our God with our confession, seeking forgiveness of sins and life in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ. So we want to pray this prayer of confession together that we find in our bulletin. Uh, We'll pray this prayer out loud together, and then we'll leave time at the end for each one of us to confess silently his or her own personal sins. So let's pray this prayer together, not just with our lips, but from the heart. Most merciful Heavenly Father, we confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. We have sinned by what we have done and by what we have left undone. We have not loved you with our whole heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly repent. For the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us. May your Spirit help us to delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. In Jesus' name we pray. Hear our prayers, O Lord, not on account of our righteousness, but on account of your great mercy, for we pray in Jesus' name, amen. <clears throat> well, dearly loved people of God, you've heard God's law and have confessed your sins to our merciful Heavenly Father. 
The Holy Spirit assures us with these words from 1 Peter 2, verses 4 through 10. As you come to him, a living stone rejected by men, but in the sight of God chosen and precious, you yourselves, like living stones, are being built up as a spiritual house to be a holy priesthood, to offer spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God through Jesus Christ. For it stands in Scripture, Behold, I am laying in Zion a stone, a cornerstone, chosen and precious, and whoever believes in him will not be put to shame. So the honor is for you who believe. But for those who do not believe, the stone that the builders rejected has become the cornerstone and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense. They stumble because they disobey the word as they were destined to do. But you are a chosen race a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a people for his own possession, that you may proclaim the excellencies of him who called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Once you were not a people, but now you are God's people. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Isn't that what sinners need to hear, that we have received mercy in Jesus Christ? And that's the promise that his gospel extends to us And therefore, if you repent of your sins and believe in God's gospel promise that he grants us forgiveness of sins and eternal life by grace because of what Christ has once for all accomplished on the cross, then in the name of the risen Lord Jesus Christ and by the authority of his word, I assure you your sins are forgiven you and you are not under the condemnation of God. Uh, We need to hear that word repeatedly from God's throne of grace to remind ourselves of that truth, uh, to believe it and to respond to it with grateful service to God with the rest of our lives and with praise. And so we praise the God who's accomplished this great work of salvation for us using the words of the doxology this morning. I want to confess our faith. We need to be reminded of what the law requires, and we need to be reminded about what the gospel promises to God's people, and we have a summary of what God's gospel promises to us and who we are in Christ as a believing people. And so, people of God, what is it that you believe? I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only begotten Son, our Lord who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From there he shall come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Let us go before our God now in a time of congregational prayer together. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, we thank you for your kindness to us that you say things repeatedly to us that it might... Uh, penetrate down deep. We need to hear that we are sinners, lest we forget it. We need to hear that we are hopeless in ourselves, that it might drive us away from ourselves and to Christ. We know that it's a perpetual problem that we have to be turned in on ourselves, to be deceived by sin, to think things are not as dire as they are. And we thank you for your law that shows us clearly where we stand. Um, And for your gospel that points us where we must go. And we thank you that you have made it clear uh, in whom we can trust and find salvation, who we can come to and find rest. 
Um, we thank you that that was our Lord's mission in this world, to bring rest to your people, uh, to call people to him that they might find rest for their souls. Um, well, we thank you for the reminder once again that uh, you have provided rest in your son. And we pray that all here would embrace him by faith and rest in the sure promise of his gospel um, that we can uh, find our hope only in him. And we thank you that having believed in his name, we can come before you knowing that you are our heavenly father, that we have been adopted into your family, that you desire to hear our prayers, you invite us to come to you, you command us to come to you with all we need for body and soul. Uh, we come lifting up our requests, confessing that sometimes we don't even need, know what we need to pray for as we ought, and yet we know that you will deal compassionately with us as a father who loves us. Um, and so we, we come with boldness into your throne of grace, knowing that we have an open and welcome audience with you on account of the way your son has opened to us. And we thank you that the Spirit has given us your word, that we might see how we are to raise prayers and petitions to you so that we can come in confidence and pray for all of those things we need for body and for soul. And so we pray for our church, Lord. We pray for our ministers, our church officers, elders, and deacons. We thank you for many people in the church who volunteer and serve. We thank you for uh, our piano players, for the people that, that run the audio and video, uh, for the volunteers that, that serve us food and, and help to organize events. Lord, we pray that you would continue to bless us, that we would be thankful for all of these many gifts. Uh, we know there are many people who serve the church uh, in relative obscurity, that maybe they do things that a lot of people aren't even aware of. But we thank you that you see everything that's done in your service. Uh, and that you are glorified when we use our gifts to serve the body, and we're thankful uh, for this body of believers in this place. Uh, we are mindful of our members who are sick, who are distressed in mind or in body or in soul. Uh, we lift up to you our brother Bill Storms and continue to ask uh, for your grace and peace to rest upon him as he awaits his heart procedure. We pray that that would go well and that he would be returned to us. Uh, we pray for um, Dave Butts and the struggles he's been having with blood pressure. We continue to uh, hold up him and Jackie to you, Lord, and ask that you would give them uh, what they need. Um, we pray for those members of our congregation who are shut in. We always remember Judith Rayner and Ann Van Stell. We pray that you would bless them and continue to watch over them, that you'd be with their families and those who care for them, and that you would give them strength. Uh, we pray that you would be with those who mourn, that they would be comforted with your love, with the hope of the resurrection and the restoration that is coming soon when your son returns in glory. May we live in that hope even in the midst of our griefs. We pray that you would be with our children and our young people. Our constant prayer is that they would grow in grace and in the knowledge of Christ, that they would walk with him in true faith, in hope, and in love all their days. Um, we pray in these evil days that you would guard them from the evil one and his kingdom of lies that you would cause them to grow and continue to prosper um, as your children and servants. Uh, be with those of our number, those expectant mothers and their pregnancies. We pray that you would keep the mothers and the babies safe and healthy. And we pray that you would be with all of your people in their various vocations, whether we are in school or working. Help us to glorify you. For those of us who are seeking work, we pray that you would provide jobs for us that we need, that we might be able to provide for ourselves and also have something to share with those who are in need. Uh, we pray that you would continue to watch over all of our members in particular who serve our country and our communities, uh, especially those in law enforcement and in the military. We pray that you would watch over those who are deployed as they serve for our sakes. Uh, we continue to pray that your blessing would be upon the work of Reverend Cortez and his ministry aboard the USS Sterrett. We pray that the seeds of the gospel he has sown among his shipmates would bear much fruit for their good and for your glory. So Father, we pray for our country and for our leaders. We pray that you would bless them, that they would be faithful servants of good and of justice. Uh, we pray that you would allow us to continue to live quiet and peaceable lives in all godliness. And we do thank you for all the blessings that we do enjoy in this great nation. We thank you for uh, the citizenship we have here and for the blessings that it comes with. Uh, we don't want to ever forget that our true citizenship is in heaven. We're, and we are awaiting our Savior from there, but in the meantime, we neither want to be ungrateful for the blessings you've given us 
uh, that we are citizens of this country and have many blessings that people in the world do not enjoy. And we pray that you would help us to be good citizens, that we would not act in sinful, self-serving, or unwise ways, but seek to glorify your name first and foremost in all things. And we pray that you would watch over your people everywhere who are in affliction or in persecution or in prison, that you would make them mindful of your love for them, that you would care for them and help them to glorify you even in the situations they find themselves. And Father, we pray for more people to be gathered into the church. We pray for the salvation of all people. We pray you would continue to bless the missionary efforts of the church. And particularly, we always think of Reverends Ferrari and Corsia and their ministries in Italy and Romania. We pray that you would bless their families and prosper their churches, that they might give glory to your name. Bless our faithful seminaries who prepare men to proclaim the gospel of Christ's kingdom. Bless all of our members who labor at Westminster and bless also those students who are preparing even now to minister the word of your son to the world. We pray that you would be with our unbelieving friends and family, that you would work your grace and faith in their hearts. Uh, that is an earnest prayer for many of us, Lord, and we pray that you would answer it and help us to guide them into the way of peace. And for those who have come to you, Lord, we, we desire to be sanctified more and more, that you would help us to pursue holiness with zeal and gratitude, that you would help to uh, give us strength to stand against our enemies, the devil, the world, and our own flesh, Remind us often that he who is in us is greater than he who is in the world and help us to stand the evil day and to withstand him in the might that you've given by your spirit. And encourage us always with the hope that by the spirit's power we will be sanctified completely because you have promised and you are faithful and you will surely do it. And so we pray above all that your son would come quickly and that at his coming he would find us faithful and fruitful in his service. And hear us as we conclude with that prayer he taught us to pray, saying together, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. We now have the opportunity to worship God with our gifts and offerings. The offering this morning is for the general fund.
Let's take up our psalters once again and turn to number 298. Comfort, comfort ye my people. And we'll stand together and sing all the verses of number 298. <laughs> to open God's word together. Let's ask him to bless it to us. Let us pray. Father in heaven, your son said that blessed are those who hear your word and keep it. We know that we cannot hear your word unless you speak it to us and unless you also give us ears to hear it and hearts to keep it. So we pray that you would speak, Lord, for your servants are listening and that you would open our ears and our hearts to hear and keep your word by the power of your spirit. So bless us, we pray, for we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Please be seated. And please turn with me in the Gospel of Mark to chapter 14, 13, I'm sorry, 13. We're going to begin our reading at verse 14, or our text at verse 14, and read through verse 23. That's the section that we've come to. If you're visiting with us, we've been considering a series through the Gospel of Mark in the morning, and we've come to verse 14 of chapter 13. It's on page 1081 of many of our pew Bibles. Mark is the second book of the New Testament between Matthew and Luke. So Mark chapter 13, it's been a couple of weeks since we've considered part of this section. So I'm going to read beginning at verse 1 and read through verse 23 to remind us of where we are in Mark's gospel. So Mark chapter 13, our text will be 14 to 23, but we'll begin our reading at verse 1. And let's pay careful attention for this is God's own word. And as he came out of the temple, one of his disciples said to him, Look, teacher, what wonderful stones and what wonderful buildings. 
And Jesus said to him, do you see these great buildings? There will not be left here one stone upon another that will not be thrown down. And as he sat on the Mount of Olives opposite the temple, Peter and James and John and Andrew asked him privately, tell us when these things will be and what will be the sign when all these things are about to be accomplished. And Jesus began to say to them, see that no one leads you astray. Many will come in my name saying, I am he, and they will lead many astray. And when you hear of wars and rumors of wars, do not be alarmed. This must take place. But the end is not yet, for nation will rise against nation and kingdom against kingdom. There will be earthquakes in various places. There will be famines. These are but the beginning of the birth pains. But be on your guard, for they will deliver you over to councils, and you will be beaten in synagogues, and you will stand before governors and kings for my sake to bear witness before them, and the gospel must first be proclaimed to all nations." And when they bring you to trial and deliver you over, do not be anxious beforehand what you are to say, but say whatever is given you in that hour, for it is not you who speak, but the Holy Spirit. And brother will deliver brother over to death, and the father is child, and children will rise against parents and have them put to death, and you will be hated by all for my name's sake, but the one who endures to the end will be saved." But when you see the abomination of desolation standing where he ought not to be, let the reader understand, then let those who are in Judea flee to the mountains. Let the one who is on the housetop not go down or enter his house to take anything out. And let the one who is in the field not turn back to take his cloak. And alas, for women who are pregnant and for those who are nursing infants in those days, pray that it may not happen in winter. For in those days there will be such tribulation as has not been from the beginning of creation that God created until now and never will be. And if the Lord had not cut short the days, no human being would be saved. But for the sake of the elect whom he chose, he shortened the days. And then if anyone says to you, look, here is the Christ, or look, there he is, do not believe it. For false Christs and false prophets will arise and perform signs and wonders to lead astray, if possible, the elect. But be on guard, I have told you all things beforehand. Thus far the reading of God's word, may he bless it to us. We're returning this morning to the Olivet Discourse. Uh, we, we call it that because it happened on the Mount of Olives, and it was a discourse that Jesus delivered to these disciples, answering their question about the destruction of the temple and when these things would be. Um, and we said at the beginning, as we began to consider this discourse, it's very important for us to not get off track, to remember the purpose for which Jesus gives his disciples this teaching. We've been saying from the beginning that the purpose of this discourse is not to reveal to them new and mysterious and secret information about the future, um, but rather to promote faith and obedience in a time of distress and upheaval. Um, Jesus wants his disciples to be prepared. He wants the church to be prepared um, so that they can react with faith and obedience to the distressing events that are going to happen in the world. Um, Jesus emphasized the importance of that in the world in general. We could say verses 3 through 8 are really dealing with what the world will be like, the history of the world, and that they have to react the right way to it, that not to regard everything that happens as the end. Um, if you watched any of the coverage of uh, the earthquake in the East Coast and how they covered it, you would have thought that it was the end. Um, and I think it was all of us as Californians just sort of laughed at the overreaction to a 4.8 earthquake. If you're like me, you thought, I don't even get out of bed for 4.8. Um, but, you know, it's, it was the biggest earthquake in 139 years, and they let you know it. Um, so next time they make fun of us for our overreaction to the weather, you can make fun of them for their overreaction to earthquakes. But it's another reminder, isn't it, that the truth of what Jesus said, these are the kinds of things that are going to characterize the world. And if we begin to think it's the end of the world, every time an event comes, Jesus says that's not correct. He's teaching us something important about the history of the world in those, in those verses. And then he moves from the history of the world to what it's going to be like for the church in this world. Uh, verses 9 through 13 really had to do with the mission of the church in the world. Uh, to prepare his disciples and the church they founded for the future period, which would entail both persecution and mission. This is also the world that the church 
will live in. His people have to be ready for that. But the initial question the disciples had asked was about the destruction of the temple and when these, the signs of these things will be. So having laid this groundwork of what will characterize the world and what will characterize the mission of the church, Jesus is really returning to the question they asked here um, and telling them about uh, what are the signs that these things are happening and what God's people are to do when these events happen. Uh, preparing his disciples, particularly those who are in Judea, uh, to, to flee when the time is right and to be on their guard against those who would try to lead them astray in those difficult times. Um, in that sense, our Lord's commands in this section are, are fairly clear. Uh, when the time comes, flee. If people say, I've come, don't believe it. And be on your guard about anyone who would turn you away from what I'm telling you to do. Uh, that's very simple. Um, the complexities come in some of the other things that Jesus says here um, and has le led to a lot of disagreement and a lot of misunderstanding about what Jesus is doing here. Um, but if we take it on a very simple level, Jesus is letting them know what will happen, uh, when, it, when they should flee, what to do, uh, where they should go, and why they must not be distracted from what Jesus is telling them to do. Um, these things all have a historical purpose for God's people, but I thought um, this is not exactly the sermon I sat down to write when I first started, but I realized my first point was going to be about a sermon length. So rather than making a gigantic sermon for you all, I thought we could maybe separate what's happening here be, and, and think about it this way. Uh, Mark says to us in verse 14, let the reader understand. Um, there, there's a theological importance to what's happening in these events that I think we ought not to miss before we think about what historical circumstances will arise and what people are to do at that time. I think we first have to understand theologically what's happened here before we can look at what will happen in history. Uh, so it may be that a lot of the questions that you came up with as I was reading along we're not going to answer this week. Uh, Lord willing, we'll answer them next week. But we want to do uh, what God's Word tells us to do, to make sure that we understand theologically why these things are happening. So I plan to return to this passage again next week but this week, I want to talk about it theologically. What is happening here in the destruction of the Jerusalem? And I want to think together about the reason for ruin and the renewal of Christ. That's how I want to think about this theologically, the reason for ruin and the, and the renewal of Christ. Um, the, Jesus is telling God's people about something that's going to happen so that the church will be prepared when those events take place when the events leading up to the destruction of the temple are happening in time and history, when it's destroyed by the Romans so that they'll be prepared. Um, I plan to make the case, and I hope to as we go along, that Jesus is describing what's going to happen in Jerusalem with the destruction of the temple and how God's people who are living at that time need to respond to those events. He's instructing them about what to do as a loving Lord who cares for his disciples. Um, but of course, it's, it's hard for us to listen to the rest of it as soon as we hear when the abomination of desolation comes, uh, when you see him standing where he ought not to be, um, then of course our minds and hearts are immediately taken up with the question, what is this? How are we to regard this? How are we to think of it? Um, but I think we know for certain what people would first think when Jesus said that. Uh, when he said that to his disciples, I think everyone who knew their Bibles, who knew their, their history, would say, this is what Daniel described would happen uh, at the time of the Maccabean Revolt. That, that's the, the, ab, the uh, abomination of desolation that they remember, um, that, that would stand out to them in their minds. Uh, it may be helpful for us to think of that term in terms of a, a desolating sacrilege or the sacrilege that makes desolate. Um, because what happened at that time, roughly about 160 years before Jesus, uh, was that Jerusalem was taken over by a foreign power and the leader of the Seleucid Empire came in and what he did was he erected a statue to Zeus and put it on top of the altar in the temple and offered sacrifices to Zeus on top of that altar. Um, and it was a, a terrible sacrilege to do that on God's altar, to, alter, to, to offer sacrifices to a foreign god. 
Um, and it was an abomination to do that, and it was an abomination that made desolate. They couldn't, they had so profaned the temple that they had to retake Jerusalem, they had to cleanse the temple before the sacrifices in the temple could be resumed. So it was an abomination that made desolate. It was an abomination that cut off the sacrifices of God's people for a time. It was a desolating sacrilege in that sense. It was a sacrilege that made desolate the ability to offer the sacrifices that God had commanded to be offered. Uh, Daniel predicted that. It was fulfilled in, in those days far after Daniel. But God's people would remember that, that abomination that was committed in the temple that cut off sacrifice for a time. It made the sacrifices desolate. And so when Jesus references that event and says there is another abomination of desolation coming, um, that would have struck them as a very serious thing. That Jesus is saying there is another sacrilege that's going to happen that's going to make desolate uh, the worship of God's people in the temple. And when these events occur and when you see them coming, you are to react by fleeing, by fleeing Jerusalem. Uh, fleeing Judea and fleeing to the mountains. Um, and what we want to think about is why. Why do these events happen? Um, and how is Jesus presenting this to us so that we can understand what the scriptures say about these things and why these things are happening? Again, we can kind of demystify this process if we just remind ourselves that this is the old problem that has repeated again and again in the history of God's people. The problem of their abominable practices leading to an abomination that desolates the worship of God and makes the continuing carrying out of the old covenant sacrifices impossible. Um, God's people have done this to themselves again and again. If we think back to the history of the places of worship of God's people, this becomes clearer and clearer. Um, we can think back to when the tabernacle, the house of God, dwelt at Shiloh in the days of Samuel. And we remember that Eli was the priest and his sons were ministering in the, in the house of God at Shiloh. And they were doing abominable things. They were sleeping with the women who served at the tabernacle. They were stealing from God's offerings. They were engaged in every manner of wickedness. And God sent the Philistines against the people of Israel, and they decided to commit another abomination. They said, you know, what will be really good for us is if we take the Ark of the Covenant out of the Holy of Holies and to carry it before us into war. Because surely if the Ark goes before us, God will have to act for us. Uh, my dad once called this the God in the box theology. We have God in the box, so let's carry the box out to war. And then when we go, he'll have to intervene for us. Well, God had said, don't take the Ark of the Covenant out of the Holy of Holies unless I tell you to move the house of God. Um, but they did it anyway. They went into the Holy of Holies when they were not supposed to do it. They carried out the Ark of the Covenant into battle. And what happened? What was the result? Um, the Ark was captured God's people were delivered into the hands of the Philistines. Um, the ark was taken and put in the house of Dagon, the Philistines' god. Um, and, we're, and we're told later that the house at Shiloh was destroyed. Um, because of their abominable conduct, God sent an abomination that desolated their ability to worship. He killed their priests. He allowed the house to be destroyed. We know wonderfully that after they left God alone to work, he worked powerfully among the Philistines. So they said, get this thing out of here. This God will kill us all. Um, God is powerful. That wasn't the point. The point was when you commit abominations, it leads to desolation. That was the lesson they should have learned at the Ark of the Covenant and the incident at Shiloh. They didn't learn it. And after Solomon built a temple in Jeremiah's day, God's people were committing abominable practices. We said back in chapter 11 when Jesus was in the temple that he quoted from Jeremiah's famous temple sermon um, saying that God intended this to be a house of prayer for all nations. You've made it a den of robbers. 
That was what Jeremiah had said in his day, that God's people had made it a den of robbers. Instead of it being a holy place, it's come where the people go after they've been out thieving. After they go commit wickedness, then they run back to the temple as if it's some kind of robber's hideout. And Jeremiah brought the word of the Lord against the people and against the religious community in that day and pronounced that destruction was coming on account of their abominable practices. Jeremiah brings the word of the Lord in chapter 6, verses 6 and 7. He says, this is the city that must be punished. There is nothing but oppression within her. As a well keeps its water fresh, so she keeps fresh her evil. Violence and destruction are heard within her. Sickness and wounds are ever before me. Then a few verses later, God says, They have healed the wounds of my people lightly, saying, Peace, peace, when there is no peace. Were they ashamed when they committed abomination? No, they were not at all ashamed. They did not know how to blush. Therefore, they shall fall among those who fall. At the time that I punish them, they shall be overthrown, says the Lord. Because of their abominations, what did God allow? An abomination that made desolate. Nebuchadnezzar came into the holy city. He destroyed Jerusalem. He destroyed Solomon's temple. He carried away all the holy things. It was an abomination that made desolate, but it was an abomination that made desolate on account of the abominations God's people had been committing. God said, I'm going to make it desolate because you can't be trusted with holy things. I'm going to cut off the sacrifices. And when Jesus comes into Jerusalem and comes into the temple in that day and pronounces against that temple, he's doing the same thing. He's addressing the old problem that God's people have always had, that over and over again in the history of Israel, an abomination of desolation, a desolating sacrilege has come on the holy place as a result of their abominable conduct before the Lord. Um, This is the old problem that God's people have endured again and again. But we know that in the chapters that follow, we're going to have an abominable thing that God's people do, unlike any abominable thing they've done ever before in their history. A final and terrible abomination that is in one sense to be the continuation of the old problem, but really this time in a new and truly horrible form. An abomination so horrible that it can hardly be contemplated. And it's the abomination of crucifying and killing the Son of Man. Crucifying and killing the Messiah that God sends to them. Who is not only true David's greater son, but is also true God. They put him to death. Peter captures the abominable conduct of his fellow countrymen uh, in his Pentecost sermon. The words are so familiar to us that maybe when we read it, we can't be struck by, by his words in the way they would have struck the hearers as they heard them. But what does Peter say in Acts 2, 22 and 23? He says, men of Israel, hear these words. Jesus of Nazareth, a man attested to you by God, with mighty works and wonders and signs that God did through him in your midst, as you yourselves know, this Jesus, delivered up according to the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, you crucified and killed by the hands of lawless men. God sent him to you, he attested to you who he was, and you crucified and killed him. You may have used the hands of lawless men to do it, But you, the men of Israel, killed him. Um, It's a damning indictment by the Holy Spirit against the conduct of God's own people. It carries forward that thought that we see happening in the Gospels. When lawless men like Pilate and his soldiers crucified Jesus, but they crucified him at the insistence of his own people. Remember that terrible accounting Matthew gives us 
in Matthew 27, 22 through 25, when Pilate says to the crowd, then what shall I do with Jesus who is called Christ? What should I do with the one called Messiah? And they all said, let him be crucified. And he said, why? What evil has he done? But they shouted all the more, let him be crucified. So when Pilate saw that he was gaining nothing, but rather that a riot was beginning, he took water and washed his hands before the crowd, saying, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, his blood be on us and our children. This is an abomination. To do this. And not only do they do it, but they insist that the blood guilt fall on them. Right? Pilate is a lawless man. There's nothing good in what he does there. But he says, I'm not going to bear the responsibility for this. His blood is on your heads. And they accept it. They all said, we're told, his blood be on us and on our children. This is an abomination. An abomination that's been committed in Israel unlike any they've ever committed before. And I think we see something of the consequences of that when Matthew reports uh, in Matthew 27, 50 and 51, and Jesus cried out again with a loud voice and yielded up his spirit and behold, the curtain of the temple was torn in two from top to bottom. I think that is meant to impress on us the significance of the death of Christ, both for his own dearly loved people and for the people who have rejected him. I think for his own dearly loved people, it symbolizes to us that the way that had kept us out of the Holy of Holies has been opened. That there is now an entrance, a way to enter in for God's own dearly loved people, those for whom Jesus died. There's a way now in to the true heavenly holy of holies. Every time we celebrate the Lord's Supper, we pray a prayer afterwards that profoundly celebrates the fact that we have been able to enter into the holy of holies. We've been able to enter in without fear. We are able to enter in because the way has been opened by our Lord Jesus Christ. That symbolizes to us that those who were outside may now enter in. But I think we can also say to those who rejected the Lord, when he came to his own and his own people refused to receive him, that tearing of the temple veil is also a sign that God is exiting his temple. It's a sign to them that the glory is departing. It's God's way of saying to the people who reject the Messiah he sent, I don't live here anymore. This place has now lost its significance. The old order has been finished in the death of my son. And as a judgment that was promised in the old covenant for those who reject the Lord, the glory has departed. The glory has left. God has abandoned his temple. He's departed from that earthly temple in Jerusalem, never to return again. The old problem of abominations that finally result in a desolating sacrilege is carried forward in a new and horrible way. This is the last and the worst expression of the rebellion of God's people in the death of his son, crucified and killed by his own. And this abomination, not surprisingly, will set off a cascading series of abominations in the life of God's people. But all of those should be seen as aftershocks of that great event. I think sometimes in people being obsessed with the destruction of the temple in 70 AD, particularly those of our brothers and sisters who see all of these events future um, and are looking for the end time significance of all of these things, what we miss when we do that is understanding the death of the Son of God is the significant event. 70 AD is just an aftershock of that, is a result of that. Um, It's not the main event. And it shouldn't surprise us if the glory has departed the temple and the death of the Son of God has finished that old order that the temple loses its significance and gives every evidence that the glory has departed. 
that had happened already in Jesus' day and it would only continue with worse abominations as it went on. The destruction of the temple in 70 AD is the necessary consequence. It's the, it's the, the finishing out of the consequences of the death of the Son of God. And it will show visibly that the glory has departed by what kind of abominations are committed there, particularly leading up to the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Commentators report that a whole series of villainous events were committed by Jewish zealots in the temple precincts during the period from November 67 to the spring of AD 68. During this period, the zealots moved into and occupied the temple area, allowed persons who had committed crimes to roam freely in the Holy of Holies, and perpetrated murder within the temple itself. These acts of sacrilege were climaxed in the winter of 67-68 by the farcical investiture of the clown Fanny as high priest. When he says clown, he means a literal clown, someone who is dressed up like a clown, and they took him and made him high priest as a big joke. Um, Josephus reports that they dragged their reluctant victim out of the country and dressing him up for his assumed part as on the stage, put sacred vestments upon him and instructed him how to act in keeping with the occasion. To them, this monstrous impiety was a subject for jesting and sport, but the other priests beholding from a distance this mockery of their law could not restrain their tears and bemoan the degradation of the sacred honors. When he saw this, the retired high priest Ananus with tears lamented, it would have been far better for me to have died before I had seen the house of God laden with such abominations and its unapproachable and hallowed places crowded with the feet of murderers. And Jewish Christians would have seen this. We're told that from the earliest days, Jewish Christians would meet in the, por in the porches of the temple. And so they would have had a front row seat to all of this abominable conduct. Um, and that's why many, many commentators have said they would have found this spectacle no less offensive and it seems probable that they would have regarded this last sacrilege as that desolating sacrilege that Jesus warned them of. Here is someone who is standing in a place where he ought not to stand. Um, here is someone who's been made high priest as if it's a big joke by people who've done abominable things in the, in the temple. And one commentator was of the opinion this, they saw this as the sign that was going to can, gonna, it's going to uh, cause the destruction of the temple, and in response to Jesus' warning, they fled. Um, there's abomination after abomination that's committed when the temple's finally destroyed. Titus, the Roman general, who comes in and commits abominations in the temple, including desolating it by not leaving one stone left on top of another. He burns it, and then he tears it down stone by stone until no stones are left standing. And you can still go to Jerusalem and see his handiwork. You see the foundation of the temple, the old stones on which the temple was built, but none of them are stones of the temple. Those have all been torn down and are gone. It was a desolating sacrilege. But these events are only the proof that the glory had already departed. It had departed that old order when it was finished in the death of Christ. When that old order was finished by him, crucifying Christ was the final act of abomination that put an end to that old order. And 70 AD, it just makes official and finishes off the remnants of that temple that had become emptied of glory, obsolete and unnecessary on account of the death of Christ. So is this only a story of ruin? No, it's a story also of the renewal of Christ. Because by God's wonderful grace, even in the destruction of the temple as that final act of covenant judgment sweeping away the old and obsolete order as the consequences of our Lord's crucifixion, God was pleased through that abominable act to bring forth his saving purposes. Through that act of abomination, Christ was also renewing and making something better 
in its place. It's not just the story of loss, the story of abomination, the story of rebellion. It's also the story of redemption. God uses this act of rebellion on his people's part to work the redemption of his chosen ones. This is some of the symbolism that Daniel saw in Daniel 9. When he made a wonderful prayer for mercy to God, asking him to forgive the sins of his people. And he was given a message from the angel that contained a wonderful vision of the mercy of God. And Daniel was shown a vision of weeks, and much about that can be confusing to us. But again, we need to focus on the basics of what was told to Daniel. Because he saw a picture of a coming messianic ruler who would be cut off. And that is, in his cutting off, the the holy city would be destroyed and polluted. But that in his cutting off, the new covenant that was promised to Jeremiah would be ratified. What was the new covenant that Jeremiah was given a word about by the Lord? It's wonderful promises that are maybe familiar to many of us from Jeremiah 31, 31 to 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah. Not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to bring them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God, and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me, from the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. What do a people who've committed abomination after abomination leading to desolation need? They need a new kind of covenant. A covenant that will ensure the forgiveness of their sins and that their iniquity is remembered no more. And when Jesus was going to his death and celebrating that last supper with his disciples, he revealed to them that in his death, that abominable act of rebellion, the new covenant would be ratified. But he taught them in Luke 22:20, 20, this cup that is poured out for you is the new covenant in my blood. By God's power and grace, because of his definite plan and foreknowledge, this terrible event is going to be used by him to ratify that new covenant. A covenant guaranteeing forgiveness and that no further punishment for sin would come. Daniel had seen that messianic ruler who would be cut off in the city desolated and polluted. But Daniel also saw a vision of that messianic ruler who would make the new covenant prevail. Um, It's not, I think, I think it's a little better than how it's translated in Daniel 9. He will make a strong covenant to see this messianic ruler as confirming the covenant or making the covenant prevail. It's not that he'll make a strong covenant, it's he will make that covenant strong. He will will make it prevail. That's what the messianic ruler will come to do. That will cut off further sacrifice in the temple. It will lead to a a sacrilege that will uh, lead to the destruction and desolation of the temple. But in his death, he will ratify the covenant and then he will make the covenant prevail. How does this messianic ruler make the covenant prevail? Not just by dying to make the covenant, to bring the covenant into being, but by rising from the dead to keep the covenant effective. It's the death of the Son of God that is that terrible act of abomination, but it's in his cutting off that that great new covenant is made. And he doesn't stay dead. He rises from the dead to make that covenant prevail. He's done everything that Daniel saw 
in the symbols in Daniel 9. He, by his death and resurrection, has put an end to transgression. He has put an end to sin. He has atoned for iniquity. He has brought in everlasting righteousness. He has sealed vision and prophecy. He's anointed the Holy of Holies. He's done it by his death and resurrection. The old order has been swept away, but a new and better order has been established by the death and the resurrection of the Son of God. He is the true temple who was destroyed in his death, and he's raised it again that it might be the hope of all of God's people. He is the true temple, the Lord who makes the new covenant prevail by the power of his everlasting life. Man's greatest abomination in the crucifixion and execution of Christ becomes by God's power and grace the means of ratifying and confirming to us the new covenant promises in his death and resurrection. That's why Peter's Pentecost sermon, though it hammers in the reality of the abomination they've done, does not leave his people without hope. He extends to them the new covenant hope. Because when he says to them, know for certain that God has made him both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified, when they realize that abominable conduct, how do they respond? When they heard this, they were cut to the heart and they said, brothers, must, what must we do? We've called for the blood guilt of this to come down on our heads. Now what do we do? Isn't Peter's word to them wonderful? Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins, and you will receive the gift of the Holy Spirit for the promises for you and for your children. His blood be on us and our children. What do we do? Repent and be baptized, and the promise will be for you and for your children. And because of this new covenant, it's beyond Israel, it's also to those who are far off, everyone whom the Lord our God calls to himself. Because of Christ's death and resurrection, not just Jew, but also Jew and Gentile, all who believe in Christ will be saved by what he's done. Let the reader understand Christ has come to make all things new. The old order is being swept away because it's obsolete. It's unnecessary. It was pointing forward in types and shadows to the reality that has come in Jesus Christ. There is the hope. There is the promise that God's people have been looking for. The reality of a way to be in covenant with God that assures you that he will forgive your iniquity and remember your sin no more. If you believe in Christ, these covenant promises are yours. He has died for your sins. He's been raised for your justification. He has forgiven your sin and will remember your iniquity no more. What a gospel. What a power that God has worked turning this great evil into this great good for his people. May we all embrace him by faith. Let the reader understand so that he might repent and believe and live. Amen. Let's pray together. Our Father in heaven, as we think about how many abominations your people have committed over the years, we pray that we would not see us standing apart from them, but would see this as our tragic family history of how we have responded so often to your goodness and your grace. We, we know that if we were trying to live with you in a covenant of works, we would fail utterly. We thank you for the promise that does away with the old order and brings in a new order that is ratified in the death of your son, that is confirmed by his life, that he now makes that covenant prevail, and that even though the events of 70 AD were terrible, particularly for our brothers and sisters who had to live through it, we know that you were working out your saving purposes and preserving your people even in those dark days. But we thank you that through man's greatest evil, you have brought about man's greatest good. 
and glorified your name as the God who saves unworthy sinners. So we pray that all here might hear that the promise is for them and that hearing the promise that they would repent and believe in Jesus Christ and five in forgiveness of sins and life in his name. And as we go now to your table to remember that cup that confirmed the new covenant, may we be thankful all over again for the death of Christ that has made the covenant, for the life of Christ that makes the covenant effective, and for Christ who will come again soon in glory. The theological reality of what Christ has done is that it is well with our soul, and that's what we'll sing as our song of response, number 476, it is well with my soul. We'll stand together and sing all the verses of 476.
Dearly loved congregation of our Lord Jesus Christ, lift up your hearts now to the Lord and receive his blessing. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace in believing that by the power of the Holy Spirit you may abound in hope. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ be and abide with you all. Amen. Amen. People of God, go in peace.